Good evening. The September 26th meeting of the City Council will come to order. Would the clerk please take the roll? Councilmember Newsma? Here. Councilmember Burns? Here. Councilmember Sufferton? Here. Councilmember Ravel? Here. Councilmember Reed? Here. Councilmember Heracaris? Here. Councilmember Kelly? Here. Councilmember Harris? Present. Councilmember Wynn? Here. Mayor Abyss? Uh, here. We have a full compliment and are prepared to do our work for the evening. The first item on our agenda is my uh, public announcements and proclamations. Uh, there are uh, three proclamations. Uh, the first, which I will uh, just mention, is a uh, um, proclamation uh, declaring this Saturday, September 30th, the Warren Billy Cherry Scholarship Fund Family of Scholars Day. The reason I won't go into more detail is that uh, they'll be celebrating that anniversary at a dinner uh, that I hope all are aware of and uh, hope uh, all will join me at. at and I'll be presenting the proclamation and reading it uh, of both for the um, scholars, uh, the supporters of the scholarship and the community uh, and on that occasion. But uh, many uh, thanks and congratulations to them for uh, really remarkable work that they've done over the course of these 30 years uh, in honor and memory of someone who was a, a beloved community member and educator. Council Member Reed. I just want to highlight uh, the, the great work of the scholarship. I was actually a, a scholar. Um, I guess if it's only been 30 years, then I was amongst the first, uh, the first cohort. Um, and so uh, I am uh, grateful for the education that I received at uh, Warren Cherry, or at Cherry Preschool. Council Member Nusma. My kids uh, went to Cherry Preschool as well. Love the place. If they could be in preschool forever, that's the preschool I'd want them at. I do not know how to interpret that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Council Member Kelly. As did my younger son. Had a really wonderful education at Cherry Preschool. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, this brings us now to a proclamation uh, uh, in celebration of the D&D &D Finer Foods 50th anniversary. Uh, so, whereas brothers Tom and Pete Duvikas came to the United States in 1955 from a small town in Greece, Nestani, where the main occupation was farming and keeping herds of sheep, and whereas the Duvikas brothers worked at hot dog stands and grocery stores, including Jewel, National, and Dominic's, but longed to open their own store. And whereas on October 5th, 1973, they decided to venture out and open D&D Finer Food Store, relocated to 825 Noise Street, and in 1986, opened D&D Dogs adjacent to the store. And whereas D&D Finer Foods is a neighborhood specialty grocery store that has expanded over the years and become a Noise Street institution. And whereas Tom DeVicas now partners with his son, Costa, to manage the business. And whereas D&D Finer Foods offers a variety of gourmet products, including homemade dishes made on the premises, hot and cold deli sandwiches, a hormone and steroid free meat and poultry and a wide selection of craft beer wines and spirits now therefore i do hereby proclaim october 5th 2023 is dnd &D finer foods day in the city of evanston in recognition of their 50th anniversary and my understanding is there's someone here from the family to accept this uh, so please come forward and uh, accept our congratulations and applause Councilmember Kelly. Thank you. I'd just like to make a short comment. Um, I'm just so glad that we are recognizing D&D &D Foods as such a long-standing and important member of the Evanston community as a legacy business. They, the DeVicus family and D&D &D have contributed in such significant ways, both economically and culturally, to become an iconic partner um, of the neighborhood and in the community. Their focus on serving both customers and the community so successfully for so many years makes them worthy recipient of this recognition. And also important to add, they provide lots of fun. Um, as stated, they will be celebrating their 50th anniversary on a week from this Thursday, Thursday, Friday, 
and Saturday from 3 until 7 um, with lots of great activities planned. And I know that the COSTA and the D&D uh, staff will be very happy to see you and help them celebrate 50 wonderful years. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and my understanding is uh, the final proclamation uh, will be received by a member of city council. Is that correct? Uh, so this is uh, in celebration of the 90th anniversary of the Ladies Auxiliary of Second Baptist Church. Uh, whereas the Ladies Auxiliary of Second Baptist Church, formerly known as the Live Wires, was organized. Why change that name? Was, um, fair was organized in 1933 with a membership of 12 young energetic couples. And whereas for many years its primary project was fundraising to assist with church maintenance and they've donated many church furnishings. And whereas fundraising events included recitals, bake sales, luncheons, boat cruises, bazaars, banquets, teas, and fashion shows, having raised monies not only to support the church but also scholarship funds. And whereas in 1973, the Ioni S. Brown Memorial Scholarship Fund was established to provide financial support for worthy church members accepted into college. And in 1996, the Ioni S. Brown Memorial Endowment Fund, as well as an annual scholarship day to recognize student achievements, were also established. As of June 2023, scholarships have been awarded to nearly 230 students and recipients have worked in diverse fields such as education, medicine, ministry, business, government, and social services. And whereas the Beacon of Light Scholarship was established in 2021 to provide support for students in the community, now therefore I do hereby proclaim October 8th, 2023 as the Ladies Auxiliary of Second Baptist Church 90th year and the 50th year of the Ionia S. Brown Memorial Scholarship Fund Day in observance of the many accomplishments provided to the church and the Evanston community over the years. Thank you so much and congratulations. Uh, the uh, September 26th City Council meeting will resume. Uh, I want to apologize to any community member who uh, heard or saw any of what just occurred. Um, we do our best to keep these uh, meetings free of that kind of uh, attack and abuse. And I know that it can be really painful for some people. So um, we'll continue to try our best. And I want to thank our IT team and Anderson in particular for uh, the work you do. Um, we have a stroke of good fortune. Um, as it turns out, there's nobody this evening seeking to give public comment via Zoom, so we're not gonna have to let people into the Zoom, um, though it will still be running for purposes of recording. Um, and with that, I appreciate everyone's uh, patience uh, as we figured out the proper way to handle this situation, and we'll move forward. Uh, before concluding my public announcements, I do wanna additionally announce that we are in the midst of Hispanic Heritage Month, which runs from the middle of September through the uh, middle of October. Um, the city has a number of events planned, and there are other community events planned as well, as well to celebrate uh, our Latinx community and uh, their contributions to Evanston. Uh, and so I would just encourage everyone to um, look up those events, participate, uh, and uh, be a part of, of the, uh, the various uh, uh, events. That concludes my uh, public announcements and proclamations. Next on the agenda is the city manager's public announcements. Yes, good evening, Mayor, member of the City Council, Clerk Mendoza. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for members of EPD for being here this evening. Um, very briefly, we're going to turn it over to uh, Joy Norris, our Cultural Arts Coordinator, and Melissa Molitor, um, for a brief announcement on an exciting event happening next weekend. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, Thank you so much, City Manager Stowe, for making the time for us to talk about cultural arts in Evanston. Again, my name is Joy Norris. I'm the cultural arts coordinator. And beside me is chair of the Arts Council, Melissa Rahman Malator. Um, we would like to discuss some exciting events that we have coming up um, this month and going into the end of the year. On October 8th, Sunday at 3 p.m., we will be unveiling the bronze bust of Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable, which has been a long time coming project. Um, it was commissioned years ago by Leslie Benodin, who was a member of the Haitian community in Evanston, who um, unfortunately passed in 2019. Um, and commissioned uh, sculptor Eric Blum, who is internationally known for his like beautiful bronze sculptures around the world. Um, but Fortunately, we will be able to have Mr. Benedine's daughter um, to attend the unveiling and we'll be able to honor his legacy. 
at the unveiling. We'll also um, have catering uh, from Kins and Creole. We'll have speakers there from the Haitian American community um, and Mayor Biss. And um, we're really excited to unveil this at the corner of Church and Orrington at the Evanston Public Library, the main branch. Um, coming from that, we will we have opened up the call for nominations for the Mayor's Awards for the Arts, uh, which will result in a celebration of a bright night um, of the arts that will take place on Wednesday, November 15th at yeah, 6 p.m. at Theo Ubieke um, Theater, which we're really excited about. Um, all of the information for the form to nominate artists and arts organizations in Evanston is on the Arts and Culture website on the city page. Um, and we're very excited to have everybody share it far and wide so the breadth of artists and arts organizations that are practicing in Evanston can be recognized and considered for this really wonderful award, which we're in the 45th year of honoring. So it's just wonderful. Um, there are a lot of other things that we're excited to discuss as we go into the future of looking at arts and culture in Evanston, and I will turn it over to Chair Molitar to speak more to that. Hi. Thank you all for having us here. Um, I am, you're gonna be seeing me because I'm gonna be getting all of you excited about the arts in Evanston. Um, we have, I think it's the 50th anniversary of the Evanston Arts Council that's coming up in 2025. And I think that we are at a very um, pivotal point when it comes to the arts and, um, and culture in Evanston. We have, I mean, the, the artists and arts organizations and projects, everything that's going on in our city, it's really incredible and we really want to make sure that we are highlighting that, supporting that. Um, we are kind of ra like ramping up to 2025. So we're starting planning now, 2025, in my mind, <laughs> in my world, um, is gonna be like the year of the arts in Evanston. Um, and so we have a retreat coming up with the Arts Council to start planning for that. We wanna activate all of the neighborhoods, as many people as we can, get them involved in art making and sharing, exhibiting. Um, one of the big goals that we have is to bring back the Lakefront Arts Festival, um, which uh, hopefully is still part of the conversations around being funded uh, through the community benefits package. Um, but there has been a lot of excitement about the potential of that coming back. Um, and I think it's really important to remember that it's not just about, it is about the arts and celebrating the arts and bringing everyone together through the arts because it's such a community builder. But it's also, um, it goes a lot deeper than that. The Lakefront Arts Festival, we really want to reimagine it so that it is going to be um, a way to bring specifically black and brown people to the lake, which uh, has been a very difficult thing, um, especially, you know, as a result of redlining, we really want to try to um, find ways to get people back to the lakefront. So, but using this through the art, like doing this through the arts. So there's a lot of conversations about um, economic development and how the arts play a role in that, health and human services, how the arts play a role in that. And so I'm hoping that these conversations keep going and that the arts are really recognized as uh, the powerful vehicle that it is for our community. So that's just sort of a teaser. I am gonna be coming back with a presentation um, next month, but um, very excited, very excited about the arts in Evanston and have this celebration uh, coming up in a year and a half. So thank you. Thank you, Joy and Melissa. Councilmember Reed. I just want to say thank you, and I think, Joy, this is your first time in front of the council. Yes. Oh, welcome. And our next item is we are approaching the one-year anniversary of the swearing-in of Chief Shania Stewart, uh, who is doing an outstanding job and wanted to give her an opportunity to come here tonight and prevent uh, present a state of the EPD. Uh, she has a, a presentation, and I'll turn it over to Chief Stewart.
Good evening, Mayor Biss, City Manager Luke Stowe, members of the City Council, and Clerk Mendoza. Tonight I will be speaking about the current state of the Evanston Police Department and will be highlighting some important information from me as a newly appointed Chief of Police back in October of 2022. This presentation will briefly cover five main topics. Crime trends, current staffing, community engagement, notable accomplishments, and where we're going. Having been hired in mid-October of 2022, I've chosen to reference November 1st, 2022 through August 31st, 2023 for all information unless stated otherwise. Overall, there has been a slight downward trend in crime. Calls for service do not include any self-initiated officer activity and simply tracks responses to emergency and non-emergency requests for police service. I've implemented online self-reporting. This offers individuals the ease of filing a police report on their own and whenever is most convenient. Additionally, it frees up time for officers to address in-progress incidents while also mitigating our staffing issue. More on that later. Property crimes are up a tick 1% while crimes against persons in society are down 4% and 6% respectively. This is in comparison to the same time frame one year prior. As it relates to crimes against property in which we've seen the small increase, I want to highlight an example of how I proactively addressed it. This is motor vehicle thefts, a problem issue not unique to Evanston. The chart tracks reported motor vehicle thefts from November 2022 through August 2023 in Evanston. From November through March, Evanston averaged over 26 motor vehicle thefts per month. In March, EPD's intelligence unit coordinated with neighboring agencies to collect data on stolen vehicles and recoveries. They analyzed that data to predict the most likely locations and times for both thefts and recoveries. In early April, the Evanston Police Department Special Operations Group with Intelligence Unit and several patrol officers participated in a three-day motor vehicle theft saturation mission coordinated by the Skokie Police Department, resulting in nine arrests and five recovered stolen vehicles. Evanston's average motor vehicle thefts in the following months, April through August, have dropped to 11. That's a 60% reduction. That's real impact. Gun violence is a topic that has received a lot of attention, including mine. From November 2022 to August 2023, EPD has taken 73 firearms exclusive of gun buyback events. Additionally, two individuals were arrested and charged with first degree murder. That specific homicide involved the use of firearms. 41 individuals have been arrested for unlawful use of a weapon, and two individuals were arrested for robbery involving the use of firearms. I mentioned staffing a moment ago. Prior to my appointment, EPD publicly acknowledged a substantial loss in sworn staff. This was also reported by several media outlets. Additionally, the department announced cutbacks in investigative services as a direct result of having fewer detectives. This issue is not unique to the department. I'm sure most of you are aware that it has been happening nationwide, and it's one that demands attention in order to reverse this trend. I want EPD to be a desirable destination for police officers and have been able to increase sworn staff by 5% in less than a year. We're continuing to move forward to replenish our numbers despite having to cope with planned retirements. The reality of onboarding police officers takes time and does not have a 100% success rate. How have we done this? I proactively address recruitment and retention, first by working with the union boards and HR, we have been able to negotiate a fair contract both for officers and sergeants. Additionally, under the leadership of Deputy Chief Wright and Commander Sullivan, the EPD recruitment team hosted a series of informational sessions. In terms of marketing, we use the blue line, leverage our social media to create unique advertisements for distribution and create a hiring webpage for simplified access to information. I'd like to take this time to really acknowledge our city's human resource department. We cannot take full credit. This is a team effort and the human resource department has done some heavy lifting for us. Thank you to all the staff of the human resource department for assisting us with our staffing needs. We will continue these efforts to rebuild the department. 
We developed a community relations unit, which is comprised of community policing unit, school resource officers, and the newly created community engagement and outreach unit. I specifically want the SROs to fall under this unit to act as a mechanism of community relations and engage with the youth in a more restor restorative manner. The community policing unit will continue to operate working within wards addressing quality of life issues, attending ward meetings, and attending events. The CEO is tasked with facilitating programs, coordinating events, recruiting, building relationships with stakeholders, to name a few. Of their many areas of work, one example is the development of the community survey that will be available soon. It hopes to capture feedback focused on safety and policing in Evanston. I'm encouraging all community members, residents, and businesses to provide their feedback. These are some of the projects the Community Relations Unit has worked on. Displaying the police department's transparency page recently, it's difficult for me to decide where to discuss during this presentation because it has so many offerings. It's developed and maintained by the members of the Community Engagement and Outreach Unit, so I'll include a few broad brush strokes of crime statistics, mapping, community programs, department policies, workforce demographics, recruitment information, department programs. I could go on and on. It's very easy to navigate and translate to numerous languages. The transparency page offers robust information on many topics. Here is an example of a customizable crime map. This particular screenshot is for the month of August. It's been manually filtered to show fraud, drug offenses, robbery, and motor vehicle thefts. I want to thank the city's GIS specialists for assisting with the development of this page. Immediately after my appointment as chief, my goal is to meet and connect with the community. A series of coffee with the chief events were held throughout the city in each ward. The events were hosted at businesses such as Barry Pike, nonprofit agency like Courage Cafe, and community centers. These early events provided a better understanding of what residents wanted from the department. Engagement and respect are key to building and maintaining trust. As you can see, we have been busy. The next several slides are pictures of some of the events we attended throughout the year. In the spring of 2023, the Evanston Police Department hosted its first Spanish-speaking Community Police Academy. The six-week long program was planned and facilitated by officers Galindo and Herrera and was done completely in Spanish. This was a new, fresh idea that came from officers and community working together. We have relationships with tri Trilogy Behavior Health that allows for round-the-clock resources to individuals who may need mental health services. Hosting pop-up events allows us the ability to engage with the public and bring awareness to the resources available. We also have a solid relationship with the Foster Senior Club. Officer Adam Howard does a great job of being present and participating in the event with our senior community. I'd like to highlight our accomplishments over the past year. We've really done a superb job in all areas of police work. Despite a department-wide staffing shortage, we have done the very best we can in providing exceptional customer service to our community. Traditionally, the department hosts a gun buyback event each year. While I added another, addressing gun violence in as many ways as possible is a positive step. Uh, Chief Stewart, do you mind uh, breaking off for a moment? All right, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it very much.
All right, thank you very much, everybody. We appreciate your presence here. All right. All right. Thank, thank you very much. We appreciate your presence here. Uh, you're welcome to stay in the chamber of, if you maintain decorum. The city council meeting is going to continue now. I would ask you to remove the signs from the chamber in uh, compliance with our city council rules. Uh, Chief Stewart, could you continue, please? All guns are then later destroyed in accordance with local and federal guidelines. In December of 2022, the event produced 98 weapons, and this last month's event produced 73 weapons. Oh. All right, if you could please leave the chamber in that case. There's, thank you very much. Thanks for your patience, Chief. Would you please continue? No problem. In sum total, EPD has recovered 164 guns in 10 months. This includes gun buyback results as well as traditional street and investigative police efforts. The department hosted a Cadillac marking event. Officers physically get down on the ground and mark the converter with a heat safe paint. Of the hundreds of Cadillac converters marked, we have received only a handful of those marked, later reported being stolen. In May, five of our police officers received Medal of Honors with the Illinois State Police. These men acted as heroes. Fittingly, each was presented with the Medal of Honor during a formal ceremony held in Springfield, Illinois. I was proud to attend. Those officers are Adam Nawaka, Corey McCray, Carl Witt, Justin Conley, and Brandon Marks. Our training committee and in-house instructors conducted much needed rapid deployment training over two course day of majority of our sworn personnel. This type of training is necessar necessarily and absolutely paramount. Additionally, we have conducted high-risk vehicle stops training, mandated safety act training, and supervisors have or will attend a course on adaptive leadership. In total from October of 2022 to the end of August 2023, EPD staff has completed 12,000 hours in various trainings. We recently launched a new program called Are You OK? Are You OK? is a way for us to check on our senior population targeting those who live alone. Interested community members can sign up to be a part of the program. A representative will simply call the senior once a week, check on him or her, and ask, Are You OK? If the senior is in need of any kind of assistance, we will respond accordingly. I've invested in technology advancements in an effort to modernize the police department. That's outside the building as well. The Evanston Police mobile app specific to the police department is now available to the public through Google Play or the Apple Store. The app serves as a resource for information regarding recruiting, text a tip, press releases, and more. Also, the department is able to send out beneficial, quick, real-time push notifications to the public for incidents we feel warranted. Situations such as road closures, areas to avoid due to active crime scene, alerts, etc. We encourage all to download the app and check it out. The Evanston Police Department is excited to announce the release of our smartphone app. The app is designed to keep residents and families within Evanston, Illinois safe by providing the latest updates and information from the Evanston Police Department. 
powered by the policeapp.com. The app greets users with a streamlined main menu to allow for seamless navigation of the app's many features. Some of those features include contact us, submit a tip, and staff directory. The app also provides users with alerts and updates on emergencies or events that may impact their area. Scan the QR code or search for the Evanston Police Department in the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store to download this free app today. Stay connected and informed. We have a variety of platforms that we use. The department's recruitment video was filmed from May through August of 2023. Members of our recruitment team work jointly with the film company to ensure that the video best reflects who we are as a department. We have a variety, a very diverse and exclusive department and proudly boasts 21% women within our department. The national average is 13%. EPD continues to be ahead of the curve. The video can be found on the city's YouTube channel or scan the QR code. It has been a challenging year, yet productive and accomplished one. I'm proud to be the chief and honored to work with the finest officers in law enforcement. This is my opportunity to thank my staff and acknowledge them publicly. Thank you, City Manager Stowe. Uh, now I have some representatives of the police department from the New Blue Fellowship for a presentation, and I think they're going to do absolutely wonderful. Thank you, City Council, for having us. Uh, great job, Chief. Um, I am here to introduce. Uh, the, our New Blue Fellowship Community All-In Recidivism Project, also known as the CARE Card, and in continuing on what the community needs uh, and also keeping brevity in mind, we're going to try to stick to our notes even though we are very passionate about this project. And so the ladies behind me are Detective Amanda Wright, Officer Anjali Daly, Detective Nina Griffin, and Officer Jackie Herrera, and I am Sergeant Tasha Wilson. And shout, special shout out to DC Security for uh, this project as well. So going off to the next slide, the WHO, um, what is New Blue Leadership Fellowship? And it's a national nonprofit organization that serves as an incubator to reform uh, like-minded officers. Uh, the first cohort was all women, and that was intentional because we bring a different perspective to policing. And uh, we were in this cohort with women from the LAPD all the way to Charleston, South Carolina, it went across the, uh, the country. And New Blue provides fellows with networks, funding, and skills to develop long-term solutions in policing, and from police officers that believe in change from within, because sometimes we are a part of the, not a part of the conversation, but we want to be a part of the solution. And seven members of the EPD were selected to participate in New Blue, and that was Deputy Chief Melissa Secludi, myself, Sergeant Francesca Henderson, Officer Daly, uh, Nina Griffin, Detective, and Officer Jackie Herrera, and Detective Amanda Wright. So, in recent years, the topic of police reform has been at the forefront of societal conversations. And in post-George uh, Floyd era, it is prudent for officers and police departments to self-reflect and identify ways to improve community trust while encouraging restorative practices. As a part of the Fellowship Capstone Project, five members of EPD worked together developing a community-centered response to reducing recidivism. The focus is simple, to keep Evanston residents and people who are not from Evanston from returning to any police facility, while encouraging other communities to also be present for their citizens with resources and care. In order to take some pressures off what Evanston so gracious, graciously offers, we're hoping that this spreads across the North Shore and beyond. Introducing and implementing the Evanston Police Department Care Card will be a step in addressing recidivism within our community at the time of arrest. The Care Card allows the police department to honor people's dignity during an extremely vulnerable moment and while finding the resources they need to minimize their return 
to the Evanston Police Department and the police departments across the country. Uh, we hope you enjoy this presentation. So you heard about the what. I'm going to just tell you about the why and why we have the CARE card. So recidivism is an issue that affects communities across the nation, including Evanston. This CARE project is an initiative designed for officers to help individuals voluntarily obtain resources when they first come into an arrest or detainment situation. So by implementing this CARE card, police officers will ask questions. They'll listen and they will learn from their detainees and arrestees on what resources they need to improve outcomes for their future and hopefully deterring them from committing future criminal activities. With the recent implementation of the Safety Act, there have been many changes to policing and one of those primary changes to policing reform is that it will allow for better collaboration between first responders and community partners to help people who come into contact with police officers. This aligns, this change aligns directly with the CARE card. So our group, we have met with individuals that have been previously arrested and incarcerated, and we have listened to their stories. One common theme that stood out was that when they needed resources prior to and immediately after an arrest, uh, they did not have it, and they didn't get it until their court case was over. We held focus groups with multiple social service agencies for feedback. And just as the Safety Act suggests, we have established those community stakeholders and partners. We have established them to collaborate with and help people obtain those resources that they said they needed. Just to name a few, the Moran Center, YWCA, City of Evanston Services, Trilogy Behavioral Health. So why care? Because if it's not us at EPD, then who? If it's not now in Evanston, then when and where? Evanston PD has always been pioneers in policing and we wanna keep it that way. Okay, so in front of you or up on the screen, I think all of you are getting copies of it, is the actual care card. Um, so using the care card will assist officers with identifying underlying issues that may have caused someone to be arrested. Um, and then working with our local community partners, the care team can identify resources. This is voluntary. Nobody has to do it, but we will ask if people want to participate. And then once they agree or they decide they want to, we build upon the caretaking questions that we already ask when someone is in custody. And we ask more questions that are about real life challenges, such as food insecurity, employment concerns, mental health concerns, uh, and many more. It's also designed to assist with a warm handoff to our community partners rather than just referring somebody or telling them to go go to this organization and they don't really have anybody to talk to. So we're working to build those relationships so it's a warm handoff. It's just taking a few extra steps uh, to assist people on a deeper level. Uh, the research, so through New Blue, we were afforded the opportunity to work with a research team and working with Kyle Dobson and Andrea Dittman and their research team of Northwestern students, 239 Evanston residents were surveyed uh, over the summer about the Care Card Initiative from all nine wards equally surveyed to get a representative sample. Uh, all the research assistants are trained. They actually went out and were walking up to people and asking questions. You can go to the next one. And this is what the research showed is an over, like, pretty good support for uh, what we're trying to do. And up on the slide, you can see the research was provided by Andrea Dittman and Kyle Dobson. Okay. I'll quickly go over the how, uh, how the care car works. Care cards will be placed in the processing area to be used during an arrest. The arresting officer will gather the necessary information to complete the care card. Participation will be optional for the arrestee. However, internal EPD policy will mandate officers to ask all arrestees for their voluntary participation. The information collected on the care card will then be forwarded to a member of the care team to review. Please enjoy the video. Hi, I'm Officer Herrera with the Evanston Police Department. I'm going to run you through our care card. The purpose of this card is to collect information to assist individuals with connecting to available community resources in an effort to reduce repeat arrest. Participation is voluntary. Are you experiencing challenges in any of the following? Homelessness? Yes. 
Substance abuse? Unfortunately, yes. Employment? Yes. Uh, do you have any mental health concerns? There are some. Would you like assistance with any of the above concerns? That would be nice. Are you open to a follow-up phone call or text from an Evanston care team member? Yeah, that would be great. Care starts during the arrest process for both in custody and compliance tickets. Once completed, the care card is forwarded to the care team. A member of the care team will contact the participant and also forward the information to the Health and Human Services Department. From there, connections are made with the appropriate local service agency to assist the participant with getting on track and reducing their chances of getting rearrested. So I'll talk about the next steps, uh, which will include for us to move forward. Uh, we want to continue. Hi, I'm Officer Herrera with the Evanston Police. We want to make sure that we're continuing to work with our community stakeholders. Um, there will be a fine-tune implementation process, which includes feedback from participants and officers that are uh, implementing the care card. Policy development to include standard operating procedures or general orders um, to make sure that the care card is being utilized uh, appropriately, and also to ensure that officers are trained on it. And then we want to make sure we, uh, we're trying to launch a pilot program by early 2024. And then we're also going to continue to track data. Um, we want to make sure, I mean, sorry, we want to thank Chief Stewart for her support of New Blue and also New Blue for their continued support as we work to elevate the offerings of our department um, to the community that we proudly serve. I just want to say thank you so much to the members of the new blue team. Appreciate it. I couldn't help but notice the pride. Uh, I was looking at Chief Stewart, the pride at which she looks on upon all of you and the important work that you all do. And I just want to say thank you so much to Chief Stewart uh, for your dedication, your hard work, your leadership, and all the great things that you're doing in EPD. And thank you to all the members of EPD uh, tonight for your incredible work. Thank you. Councilmember Harris. So we get a lot of complaints about what we do wrong in Evanston. And I want to be on the record and very clear, we made a good choice in hiring the chief. Her team is excellent. Some of you all were there before, some of you weren't. I am very appreciative of every time I call or ask a question, the help that I receive. It is always thoughtful and caring. And it's a hard job that you do. Um, it's a very hard job, and I appreciate every day when you come to work the realization that sometimes somebody might not, and you come to work the next day. So I want to say that I appreciate you all. It's a hard job. Evanston is a hard city. I've learned that sitting up here. So, again, I, I greatly appreciate the work that you all do and the care um, that you all give our residents. So thank you so much. I just want to echo those things. Uh, on top of everything else, I think it says something about the culture of the department that so many people from the department showed up this evening. Uh, the belief that you all have in the shared mission and the support that you show each other and the partnership, I think, is something that the whole city benefits tremendously from. And it doesn't go unnoticed, not only the good work that's been described, but just the number of EPD personnel who are sitting here showing their support and showing their commitment to the team. So thank you very much to all of you. The next item on the agenda is communications from the city clerk. Um, hi, I'm going to summarize public comment from um, Mike Vesoko. Um, oh, you want to read your comment? Go ahead. Well, let's or, get to public comment. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So this brings us to public comment. Uh, as mentioned earlier, fortunately, we do not have uh, any uh, Zoom public comment uh, applicants this evening. Uh, so every public commenter uh, who signed up signed up online to speak in person and each will be given three minutes. Uh, we begin with Karen Davis who will be followed by Michael Vasilko and then Denise Young. And point of uh, order is you're queuing up. I had a, at least one resident indicate that they were going to provide 
public comment virtually, they may not have known that. So if there are folks in the Zoom room, is there a way to notify them if they want to? I think they can raise their hand if they want to provide. We, we don't if have there's anyone, anyone there. We so there, there's no one who signed up, and there's no, no one in the Zoom room. No one in the Zoom room. All right. That answers that. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Davis, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Karen Davis. I live at 333 Dewey Avenue in the 8th Ward. I'm speaking in support of the Ordinance 108022 to ban semi-trucks on our neighborhood streets. I've lived on Dewey for 30 years. I raised both my daughters there. I bought our house with the knowledge that there was a local wholesale greenhouse on the corner who used small, light trucks to transport products to and from their business. This was not an issue for the first 20 years or so. The last 10 years, this business has grown in our residential area. The huge semi-trucks regularly travel to and from the business during peak seasons. These semis contribute to air and noise pollution, damage our road infrastructure, and are dangerous to walkers, bikers, and drivers due to blocking intersections, difficulty turning on our narrow residential streets, and obstructing views of the streets. Many children walk and bike to schools in our area. A business should not be allowed to grow in a residential area to the detriment of the residents. Gleason's has three other locations in other towns, Northbrook, Lake Villa, and Grays Lake, all of which are in industrial or more rural areas and have major access roads, not neighborhood streets, to access their greenhouses. This can easily be seen looking at Google Maps, Street View. You can see where they're located, not in directly in residential areas. Also on the website, the greenhouse in our neighborhood is listed as the office with the address 316 Florence, which actually is accessed from Dewey, not Florence. And the structure that is now used as the office was added to the property over the last 10 years. Nichelle Pajot, who is a neighbor who lives across the street from the greenhouse, wasn't able to come tonight, but she forwarded me the agenda from our 2016 meeting with Ann Rainey and other members of the city government, which I forwarded to um, Alderman Reed. Many of the issues, same issues were addressed at that time with little change. Um, we were able to get no idling and parking restriction signage, but it continued to be ignored. Over the last several years with Alderman Reed, we've redoubled our efforts to work to restore our peaceful neighborhood. Um, I know there was a memo from David Stonebeck that there had been no um, neighborhood complaints since 622 meeting. That is untrue. I know many of us have called 311 and sent emails. Um, the semi-trucks need to stop. That is what we're asking for, just a ban on the semi-trucks and going back to the days of using the small light trucks, which they still do use. Thank you very much for the opportunity, and thank you, Alderman Reed. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Michael Vasilko, who will be followed by Denise Young and then Rebecca Luzader. Thanks for holding the meeting for me. Uh, okay, so my comments for APW were the same as they are for this meeting. <clears throat> um, why is on item A5, Burke Engineering, um, they're doing alleys survey services. So why are they the engineering firm that you went to? Uh, being there are many surveying firms, not only in Evanston, but in other places. Nearby, Burke Engineering has not provided the Fountain Square explanation report that they uh, promised to provide, or I should say the City Council requested in June of this year and voted on as a whole and said staff provide this report and the staff agreed to do so, but months have gone by and there's been no report. So why hasn't staff delivered on the Burke explanation to City Council members uh, that was committed to in June of this year. I would, I would say don't hire Burke for anything until they come clean on what happened at Fountain Square. And why is the funding for this item referred to as 2023 general obligation bonds? bonds? I don't know how many times I've said it, and I know many other people have said it, there are no 2023 general obligation bonds approved by the city. Um, so that's, it keeps coming back like a bad coin. And um, 
people should stop making reference to it. Item A7, the purchase of more gas guzzling trucks and motorcycles. Uh, I repeat again, staff continues to demonstrate that they are climate change deniers. I don't know why that is, but it's clear by, at this point that that's just their perspective. And why again is the funding for this item being referenced as 2024 funding when there has been no budget for 2024 and council hasn't approved any funding for 2024. So that should just be removed as a line item. In all these cases, you know, the city council can't spend money that hasn't been approved. And so these, these items should not show up on the agenda. Item A9, approval of non-union employee wage increases. I'd just like to know exactly who this is referring to. Is it administrators at the you know, top of the food chain that want to raise, or is it people that actually do work? Um, in which case, I would, I would support it. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Denise Young, uh, who will be followed by Rebecca Luzader and then Ash Nissan. Hello, good evening. Um, I am here, um, uh, as well as several other neighbors from Dewey, um, in support of Alderman Reed's uh, ban on trucks. Um, so my wife and I moved into the neighborhood about three years ago. Uh, we did research on Cleason's. Obviously, it's right there. You could see it. Um, so we researched the hours. We asked the prior owners, have you had any issues with them? And they said, no, they've been great neighbors. Um, and that is true for, for a good part of our experience. But unfortunately, again, the, the 18 wheelers are a massive issue. Um, so as you all probably have seen in some of our descriptions and as we talked previously um, on the uh, uh, different meeting that we came to last year, um, they, they come in idle at all hours of the night. So I think their hours generally end around four o'clock. So they'll show up at eight, 11, midnight, two o'clock, I think six o'clock in the morning. Um, so they're, we're not sure exactly what that miscommunication is um, with them. Um, as we've previously discussed, a lot of the, the drivers of the 18-wheelers seem to be a third-party vendor. Um, and so there have been lots of efforts to try to rectify that, um, but it continues to be an issue. Um, every time it is an issue, we do call through room one and the non-emergency police to report it. Um, and they do come. Um, and when they're still there, um, I believe that they ticket them and, and talk to them. Uh, but there are just, again, a lot of issues that um, you know, for instance, and I think somebody else will talk about this, they'll come and they'll park in the street and then in the morning it's often the case that they're blocking school buses that are there to pick up children. Um, and 18-wheelers parked at 2 a.m. outside your bedroom is not a fun thing to experience, right? Um, so that is not something that we were uh, advised about, prepared for, saw when we were there before we even bought the house, right? We've seen the small trucks. Um, and that was our understanding of, of what, uh, how they transported their, their materials and what they need. Um, I don't want Cleasons to go out of business. I support them as a, as a small business, but the semi-trucks are a massive problem. Um, so I do support the proposal on the ban. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is Rebecca Luzader, who will be followed by Ash Nissan. Hello. Rebecca Luzader, I am the wife that she speaks of. Um, we bought our house about three years ago, um, as she mentioned. Um, it was not a problem when we first, sorry. Oh, okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so when we moved in, it wasn't a problem originally, uh, the first couple months, and then they got into their busy season. Um, we've had several issues with the 18 wheelers. We are the house actually that's right next to them on the block. Uh, so. We are right next to where they store all of their um, uh, soil and fertilizer. Um, so we get all of that blown onto us. So we get the garbage, we get all of the great things. Um, but the 18 wheelers have totally been the biggest issue because we can't leave for work in the morning. Um, the 18 wheelers are blocking, we'll have to go talk. We'll call 311, they're not coming right away. Um, so it's a really, really big nuisance. Um, I think the idling overnight is also really a big nuisance. Uh, the trucks are massive, and so they vibrate. You can actually feel them in the bedroom. Um, you can hear the windows actually shaking. Um, they're not supposed to be idling, and they are. 
Um, I know that they're cool trucks, so they keep them on. And so you'll just hear that going all night until they open the business the next day. Um, they are also using uh, the residential streets to do loading and unloading. Um, so they will completely block um, the, the traffic. Um, so cars are not able to go by. Uh, school buses are not able to go by. Um, it's, it's a really big challenge. Um, and we would like to specifically block the 18 wheelers. Again, we support the business. Um, small trucks are fine. They're not blocking or parking in front of people's driveways. It's truly just the 18 wheelers that cannot actually completely go in uh, because again, they are using their parking lot for storage. So their employees are not parking in their parking lot. They also can't bring the trucks into their parking lot um, because that's where all of their excessive storage is. And so all of that work happens in the actual roadway. Um, and uh, yes, I would like to petition that we block the trucks, the semi trucks. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Osh Nisan. Hi. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm calling. Or I'm, I came by to to support actually. Gleason's business model. You know, they were there before we before we moved in. That family's been in business in that location for 50 or 60 years. I was well aware of uh, of them being there, and we bought the house right across the street. We actually have two frontages to them because we have a, a double lot, essentially. Um, for any time there is an inconvenience, they have actually been more than kind and taken care of any problems that they've created. If there was a, a truck that was blocking, I would just talk to the truck driver and they'd move the truck. Um, one time, one semi like couldn't back in right and he kind of ran over the, the grass in the parkway. I, I went over and talked to Tom and he said, you know, let me fix it. And he came out and he fixed it right away. There's not no problems but they've managed these problems quite well. And I don't, you know, they, they've changed their business model dramatically to accommodate the needs of our neighborhood. And I don't understand the animus against, you know, this business that's been paying their taxes and supporting our, our community for many, many decades. Um, they actually have a truck diversion program, so they have a deal with Home Depot, and this is arranged with the Evanston Police uh, they have a community liaison officer that works with them. They stage the trucks at Home Depot, and then they bring them in on a, on a schedule. Does occasionally a trucker screw up and come and park there when they're not supposed to? They're supposed to have parked at the Home Depot? Yes, occasionally that happens. But it's part of living in a community. We all have to accommodate each other. And I'm just asking that you all consider accommodating this business that is a good actor in our community. Um, they, the semi trucks are no different than the box trucks that they use. They're just longer. There is no parking on their side of the street directly in front of my house. That's where those trucks typically park. Again, does occasionally a truck driver mess something up? Yes, occasionally that happens. But that's not their practice. Mr. Cleason and their family have really bent over backwards. They did get another location, I think in Northbrook, to help break down things so that they were bringing fewer trucks in. And again, they've worked on a plan in concert with the Evanston Police to make this work just fine. And, and it, would, it would be sad in my estimation. There's a lot of sort of anti-business animus that, that happens. And I get that it's inconvenient and sometimes that you have to wait a minute to get around. But there's never been anybody that's been mean about it. They just are trying to run a business. And I would just ask that we consider letting them do that. Thank you very much. Uh, this concludes public comment for the evening. And um, well, I'll let, you, I'll let you do it given the circumstances, 
but if you could circle up with the clerk's office after, because your name is not on the list. Uh, so if you want to speak in the future, um, I want to make sure that you sign up properly. Thank you, Mayor, and I really appreciate it. Um, my husband is traveling, and it was clearly not easy for me to bring my children, <laughs> one of which has special needs. Uh, but I did because we feel so strongly about the safety aspect. I 100% support a local business. We're proud to live by a longstanding local business. But we live at 322 Dewey, which is one of the houses across from the parking lot. And the semi-trucks have been a real problem. I don't agree with my neighbor that they have been accommodating. There have been multiple times since last spring when my daughter's school bus to her Head Start program was not able to get through. We had to go up and speak to the drivers. They didn't always respond. I saw there's a young man down our street who's maybe seventh or eighth grade and he has special needs and has a bright lift transport. I've seen that bus twice not be able to get down Dewey and have to back up and go around the block. We have had semis. We've had maybe two parked north two parked south, I've seen them parked on Mulford, and they're all trying to get into this parking lot. And because a lot of us, ourselves included, don't have garages, we park on the street. And so we can't get through. Sometimes they spill stuff. I'm fine with the panel trucks. They unload it, they, they load up at 6.45 every morning, it's great, they leave, but the semis are an issue. And um, yeah, I would just like you to consider blocking those particular vehicles. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Thank you very much. That concludes public comment for the evening and brings us to the consent agenda. Uh, I'm told that we are removing uh, items A12, A13, A14, A15, and A16 from the consent agenda, all for potential um, introduction and action to occur this evening. Except for those five items, is there anything else that folks would like to uh, remove from the consent agenda? A1. A2 and R1, please. A2 and R1. Any further requests? Uh, seeing none, I would entertain a motion. I'll move the consent agenda minus the items that have been pulled. A18. Does the motion still apply, Council Member? <laughs> uh, sh yeah, yep, yeah, I'll still move it forward. Council Member Reed moves adoption of the entire consent agenda except for. A1, A2, A12, A13, A14, A15, A16, A18, and R1. Council Member Wynn seconds. Oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Harris seconds. Uh, is there any discussion? Uh, seeing none, would the clerk please take the roll? Council Member Nusma? Aye. Council Member Burns? Aye. Council Member Sufferden? Aye. Council Member Ravel? Aye. Council Member Reed? Aye. Council Member Hedakaris? Aye. Council Member Kelly? Aye. Council Member Harris? Aye. Council Member Wynn. Aye. Uh, with nine voting in favor and none voting against, the motion carries and the consent agenda is approved. Uh, this moves us now to item A1. Is there a motion on item A1? I will move item A1, approval of the City of Evanston payroll bills list and credit card activity. Council Member Reed moves approval of the City's payroll bills list and credit card activity. Council Member Harris uh, seconds. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, would the clerk please take the roll? Council Member Newsma? Aye. Council Member Burns? Aye. Council Member Sufferden? Aye. You want to abstain? Council Member Newsma? Yeah, I'm sorry. Payroll. Oh, this was A1? Yeah. I'm sorry. Thank you for calling me out. I abstain on A1. <laughs> uh, I was thinking about trucks. Uh, would the clerk just? Oh, good. I'm glad. Would the clerk uh, <laughs> just, just start the roll from the yes. from the jump again to, to make sure that I don't miscount uh, for a change? Thank you all. Councilmember Newsma. Abstain. Councilmember Burns. Aye. Councilmember Sufferden. Aye. Councilmember Ravel. Aye. Councilmember Reed. Aye. Councilmember Hayakaris. Aye. Councilmember Kelly. Aye. Councilmember Harris. Aye. Councilmember Wynn. With eight voting in favor, none voting against, and one abstention, the motion carries and the 
various uh, items are approved. This brings us to item A2. Council Member Reed, would you care to make a motion? Yes, I will move item A2, approval of the BMO Harris Amazon credit card activity. Council Member Reed moves approval of the BMO Harris Amazon credit card activity. Council Member Harris seconds. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, would the clerk please take the roll? Council Member Newsma? Aye. Council Member Burns? Aye. Council Member Sufferton? I abstain. Council Member Ravel? Aye. Council Member Reed? Aye. Council Member Hadakadis? Aye. Council Member Kelly? Aye. Council Member Harris? Aye. Council Member Wynn? With eight voting in favor, none voting against, and one abstention, the motion carries and the credit card activity is approved. I will move uh, suspension of the rules for items A12, A13, A14, and A15. But not A16? Oh, and A16. Sorry. I a second. Council Member Reed moves suspension of the rules so that items A13, A12, A14, A15, and A16 uh, may be passed, uh, uh, may have final action taken this evening, uh, notwithstanding their ordinances being introduced this evening. Council Member Harris seconds. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, would the clerk please take the role on the motion to suspend the rules? Council Member Newsma? Aye. Council Member Burns? Aye. Council Member Sufferton? Aye. Council Member Ravel? Aye. Council Member Reed? Aye. Council Member Hadakadis? Aye. Council Member Kelly? Aye. Council Member Wynn? Aye. Council Member Harris? Aye. With nine voting in favor and none voting against, uh, the motion receives the required unanimous majority and uh, the rules are suspended. I Council Member Reed? Item A12, Ordinance 81023, authorizing the sale of city owned real property at 1808 Hovland Court. Maybe we can move them all together. Uh, I mean, I'm fine to move them all together. They're just unrelated. Uh, so I, I will move. So uh, is the consent agenda. Sure. <laughs> I will move uh, Ordinance 90023, amending City Code Section 10115C, Schedule VC of the Evanston City Code, three way stops, uh, three way stops at Grant Street and Cowper Avenue. I will also move Ordinance 91023, amending City Code Section 3. Dash four dash six C to increase the number of Class C liquor licenses from twenty two to twenty three for Egg Harbor Cafe at seventeen oh one Maple. I will move Ordinance ninety two oh twenty three amending City Code section three four six D to increase the number of Class D liquor licenses from seventy one to seventy two for the Fat Chalet at twenty nine oh two Central Street. And finally, I will move Ordinance ninety three oh twenty three amending City Code section three four six D to increase the number of Class D liquor licenses from 72 to 73 for Reza's Restaurant at 1557 through 59 Sherman Avenue. Council Thank Member you. Reed moves final passage of ordinances 81-0-23, 90-0-23, 91-0-23, 92-0-23, 93-0-23, 94-0-23, 95-0-23, 96-0-23, 97-0-23, 98-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 99-0-23, 
Uh, what's unique about this ordinance compared to what we just adopted, it has 108.22. This was introduced over a year ago, and we held it, or maybe not over a year ago, but it was introduced quite a while ago, and we've held it over um, to allow uh, Cleston the opportunity to uh, become better neighbors, and it just has not happened. Um, and I, I'm sure that if this was happening in any other neighborhood, uh, in, in one of your wards, and there were refrigerated semi-trucks sitting out in front of residential uh, neighborhoods that folks would, um, you know, uh, seek to advocate for their residents. Uh, these uh, restricted streets uh, exist in, in a number of places throughout the city. This would not be the only uh, street, residential street, that has a restriction. Um, and so looking uh, forward to support from my colleagues to ensure that we are uh, protecting these neighbors and their well-being uh, in their in their homes, but also still allowing um, Clesson to operate in the manner that they had um, 10, 15 years ago uh, before their operation grew to the size uh, that it is. And um, looking forward to uh, them continuing to operate in the neighborhood, but just in a manner that is more uh, conducive to uh, a, a residential neighborhood. Thank you. Council Member Newsom followed by Suffernan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to just be clear what this ordinance would do. And as I understand it, it would prohibit trucks, big trucks, uh, big meaning 8,000 pounds or more, on the streets in question. But we have elsewhere in city code um, some language which allows trucks to go off of a truck route within whatever quarter mile, half mile of their destination. Um, would that clause uh, be a loophole that would enable trucks to continue doing what they're doing? I guess that's a question for legal. I need to research and look that up right now. I'll see if I can get you an answer quickly. Okay. But I, uh, I suspect that language is uh, is related specifically to truck routes. Um, but I'm concerned that if we um, pass this ordinance, they might be able to uh, get away with what they're doing anyway. If I, can I respond to? Council Member Reed has probably done his homework here. Sure. Um, I, 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 I am gonna seek uh, Attorney Brian George's opinion there on if uh, folks uh, were allowed to do that. I've operated under the assumption that that is quite possible. Um, but what this will put in place, uh, since trucks are prohibited, um, whenever law enforcement, uh, one, I think it is possible that no, they will not be allowed because it is specifically trucks prohibited. But in the case that they are allowed to use that, um, you know, loophole, as you say, um, this will certainly stop the idling because law enforcement will be able to immediately tell a truck that. You know, if you're idling here, if you're waiting here, if you're stopped here, you cannot stop here, whether it's five minutes or not. This is a street where trucks are prohibited. You're able to make the delivery and just keep moving. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm sympathetic to the neighbors. I certainly wouldn't want a refrigerator truck parked out of my house at 3 a.m. Yeah, at the same time, I'm also reluctant to, yeah, make life more difficult for a business in Evanston in an environment where um, that's an increasing concern. And I understand that there are also some potential legal ramifications, you know, should we enact this ordinance. So I'd uh, like to hear from our legal department uh, from that perspective as well. It's entirely speculative, but I think it does potentially open up a possibility of litigation if this ordinance, th there could be an argument that this ordinance is cutting into their business and their existing business and that they've already made, um, they've, you know, they've operated their business in this manner for a period of time. They've grown accustomed to it. They've basically like formed their operations around how the truck routes are. And if this ordinance bites into their business in a significant way, it could potentially be an argument that, you know, it's cutting into their business. Right. And so I guess I would prefer that we could work something out without having to pass an ordinance. And I'm just curious 
when was the last go around with the management and how how have things uh, how do things stand with them and i'd like to hear from them directly too if possible so i guess that's a question for council member reed yes can i address all of that when i come back around if you don't mind all right sure that that's all i have for now thanks council member suffered and followed by burns yeah um along those lines i just wanted to confirm there's no representative of the business here uh, all right, um, but I can't ask questions there. Um, and this is just for introduction tonight. This will come back in two weeks. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Burns. Um, Attorney George, in, in uh, the uh, opinion that we have from you, uh, First Amendment takings, it talks about for taking of taking of its property and I interpret that different than cutting into someone's business or revenue so can you help me understand how this may be interpreted as taking of property um, so like actual physical property is pretty self-explanatory but something such as um, I, I, I think of like the example of somebody that's bought a um, a property that they use for rentals or with the uh, understanding that they're going to be using it as a rental and then there's they make um, significant improvements spend a lot of money on uh, the building you know when and then the zoning on that building changes or the zoning in that area changes there is case law indicating that depending on the amount of how much they've depended on the zoning in terms of how much they spent, much money they spent, and you know the, the expectations that they had on the zoning and having that kind of pulled out from under them can constitute a taking. Okay, you, even if it doesn't, um, you know, eliminate their ability to operate their business, if it just hinders it in some way that they may be able to overcome by modifying certain business practices, that still believe could be interpreted as a taking I property. mean like I said it's an it's such a fact specific thing it's yeah. a lot harder to prove for something that's not a physical taking of property I'm not going to weigh in on the merits of any claim of uh, of a, a taking I'm just saying it's a possibility okay um, yeah I, I um you know I, I certainly would will support Advan if this is just introduction, would support advancing it. Um, if this were for action today, I would only support a, a temporary um, ban. And um, but I, I, I do think it's very troubling that the owners have not um, reached out to the city or responded to the city if they haven't to work with us. I did reach out to a member of the family uh, who's a part of the business several months ago. Um, tried my best to organize a meeting between Councilmember Reed and their family. I was told that they would respond and get back to, to us, and, and they haven't as far as I understand. So I am in incredibly frustrated that they have not responded. As Councilmember Reed said, if this did happen in my ward, I will 100% want to advocate for the best interests of, uh, of uh, the community members. In, in most cases, when things do come up in the fifth ward, I'm able to reach out to the business owner. They meet with me. We figure something out. And the fact that that's not happening here is very troubling to me. So I will support um, moving this forward in hopes that that will uh, encourage the, 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 the business to come forward and, and uh, try to um, continue a conversation about this. Thank you, Chair. Councilor Bertelli. Thank you. Um, so yes, I also certainly wouldn't want to undermine a long-standing business like Cleason. I can sympathize with the neighbors. In the first ward, we have an issue of idling semis at night, and staff has been very responsive in terms of upping the enforcement. However, it has taken an inordinate amount of staff time to stay on top of this and um, to really try to curtail the loud nuisance of the idling trucks. Um, so. This evening, I will support this. I would like to hear from Cleason to understand the impact to the company. And since um, we aren't hearing from them th this evening, um, I would like to go ahead and move forward with this and hope that someone will be present at our next meeting 
to discuss impact. Thank you. At this time, no one is requesting to speak for the first time, so we go back to Councilmember Reed with two minutes and 50 seconds left. Thank you. Um, I appreciate Councilman Burns, you highlighting that story there. Um, staff has had many conversations with uh, Cleason, as I Cleason, Cleason, as I noticed, as as I noted earlier, um, you know, this has been on hold since 2022. Uh, we're almost in 2024. Um, you know, I, my goal was I was hoping that we wouldn't get to the point where we would need to move forward with introduction. It, we, we I asked the committee to move this forward to send a very clear message to Clesson that um, you got to work with us. You've got to move these trucks out of the neighborhood and um, you got to revert back to, they have two other locations. This location that happens to be in a residential neighborhood needs to operate as if it is in a residential neighborhood. Um, and even with uh, this now coming in before us for introduction, they have not uh, been responsive. There have been some efforts to make improvements. Uh, but it has not gone far enough, and this is a last uh, resort to bring relief to residents who are concerned about the safety of their families, of their children, um, and their ability their ability to go to work and access things without uh, being late. And so um, I do hope that uh, someone from Cleason will be here at our next meeting um, or that uh, myself and, and staff can have a meeting with them between now. But I, I must say that I'm, given that, this has been held out for a year. This is the, you know, we, this came to, uh, I believe, council previously, and we decided to table it then uh, until this meeting, and there just has not been action from them. So I'm not hopeful, but um, I'm certainly willing to continue to engage. Um, and, and, and I just want to note that uh, I appreciate Attorney George's, uh, Brian George's, um, um, uh, legal memo there. I, I will say that also, as Attorney George noted, that it is, you know, speculative and that th these are really fact specific cases. Uh, there isn't direct case law on this. Um, this council makes uh, adjustments to our ordinances all the time that could have uh, effect on someone's business. If we change a truck route, if we eliminate a truck route, um, that could have uh, a similar effect. Um, and, and in no way is this banning uh, Cleston from operating. It is simply saying that you have to operate in a manner that is appropriate for the residential neighborhood in which you reside. Thank you. And I appreciate the support of my colleagues tonight. Uh, once again, no one is requesting to speak for the first time. So we go back to Council Member Newsma with three minutes left. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, since this is for introduction tonight, I'm going to support it tonight. And uh, hopefully uh, that will send the message to the business that uh, the city council is serious and uh, ideally we'd be able to work something out uh, before this comes back to us for action. I would, oh, sorry. So uh, at this time, no one is requesting to speak for a first or second time. So we'll go back to council member Reed with 20 seconds left. Yes, very quickly. Um, I, I don't know if it's appropriate to modify this. Well, I'm going to modify this motion uh, instead of it having it come back at our next regular meeting, which is September or October, what? Manager Stowe. Mm, Hold on one, one, one second. Br Brian, it's not the case, is it, that our rules obligate an ordinance that has been introduced to then automatically be on the next regular meeting agenda for action, is it? Because if, if I'm right about that, you, we can just, sure. I'm happy to sure. agree to skip a meeting and, yeah. or, you know, rather than make a motion to vote on the motion and whatever. I was just going to amend the initial motion. But. And you, you were hoping to skip one meeting or? Yeah, my goal is to skip one meeting, have this come back. That'll give us a bit more time to, to speak with the folks and if we're, no. So, so here's what I would recommend. Don't do that. All right, I will. Vote. And as the chair, I commit that I'll just pull this off the agenda next time with everyone's permission so no one thinks any funny business is going on. And it'll be, if it, presuming the vote that's about to occur passes, this will be then, instead of on the October 9th agenda for action, it'll be on the October 23rd agenda for action. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, will the clerk please take the roll on uh, Ordinance 108-0-22 for introduction. 
Councilmember Newsma. Aye. Councilmember Burns. Aye. Councilmember Sufferton. Aye. Councilmember Ravel. Aye. Councilmember Reed. Aye. Councilmember Heracaris. Aye. Councilmember Kelly. Aye. Councilmember Harris. Aye. Councilmember Wynn. Uh, with nine voting in favor and none voting against, the motion carries and the ordinance is introduced and will appear on the October 23rd, 2023 agenda for action. Uh, Councilmember Hedekadis, would you care to make a motion on item R2? Uh, R1. I move um, ordinance 56023, adding title one, chapter 13, section five, small donor matching system for fair Second. elections. Councilmember Hedekadis moves passage of ordinance 56-0-23. Councilmember Reed seconds. Councilmember Sufferden. Um, yeah, I have a couple questions and I'm not sure uh, who the appropriate person to ask is, if it's you or Juan or Alyssa, but uh, um, I just wanna make sure I understand that this, this is general fund money, correct, that we could spend for any purpose. This isn't a special fund that's created for uh, supporting elections. Um, Ms. Kaplan is the, you know, uh, perhaps since it seems like there are going to be a series of technical questions, Sorry, why, don't, yeah, yeah, why doesn't someone from Reform for Illinois come forward to speak to those? Yeah, I, have, I guess I have a question about specifically how we're doing this and a couple of questions about the um, actual concept. So I'm not sure if you're, who the correct, I mean, this is money, this is taxpayer money that this isn't a check off or anything that anybody opts into. This is money that we could spend for anything else we want, but we're choosing to spend it this way. That's correct. Okay. Um, and then I see there's some restrictions. So the money goes to the candidate or the candidate's committee? Candidate's committee. Okay. And so the candidate's committee is the pass through. Is there any restriction on place, or pass through may be the wrong word, but I mean, obviously we, the money goes to them so that they can spend it. There, what are the restrictions on things that they can spend it on? Um, are there, is there anything in here that requires there's an them? extensive list? Uh, Councilman, uh, of things that are restricted that they cannot spend it on. It parallels the list under the state statute that politicians are restricted from spending campaign funds on generally. Right, but like in a smaller, like if they're gonna spend money on printing, there's no requirement that they use an Evanston business for printing. Or if they're gonna spend it on consulting, there's no requirement that they have an Evanston consultant. They can spend the money, they can choose vendors as they wish without any restriction. Yes. Okay, great, thank you, those are my questions. Councilmember Reed. Thank you. Um, actually, would still really appreciate uh, the technical assistance. So. I was reading through this, and to be clear, one question I have outstanding, let's say we have a candidate for mayor who has $100,000 in their account. Are they able to use their existing funds on top of the matching funds? So if those funds were raised before this ordinance was put into place, are they able to use those funds for the election? My understanding is yes, they are. It does not require everyone to start out at zero. Existing funds that are in people's accounts can be used as they could in any event. There is a, sorry. There is a restriction though that money, if they wanna participate in the program, any contribution they, they took over $150, they would have to return within that election cycle. So you could, they couldn't collect a bunch of $6,000 or $12,000 uh, contributions before the election and then start taking public funds, no. That's that's true, but uh, that only applies within that election cycle. So if, if there's a carryover va uh, value from a prior election cycle, my understanding is they are permitted to continue to use that money. Um, w with that in mind, I mean, I, I would like to amend this to, uh, to, to bar that. I mean, one, let me, because there's also a provision as I was reading through that says that there's a cap on the spending of, uh, you know, if, um, what is it called, ranked choice voting uh, is in place, the cap would be uh, 160,000 if ranked choice voting is not in place, 200,000, so would that cap also apply to funds raised prior to? If you've got somebody with significant funds that precede the previous election cycle, then yes. Okay. Um, 
I, I would, I'm going to move to um, amend, I don't have the language in writing, I'll see if there's a, a second and I'll put it in writing, but I, I, I would like us to move, again, this is a voluntary program, and so anyone who chooses to participate to commit not to using more than what they raised in that in particular election cycle. There are expenditure limits on what participating candidates can spend. Yeah, that's what I was, okay, so then that's what I was just asking about. Yes, and I that's didn't get already there. Right. They're already limited in how much they can spend. So a, can, a candidate can only spend 160 if we have ranked choice voting, right. 200,000 without. Right, correct. Okay. Um, I didn't notice any of this being tied to inflation, and so it seems like, go ahead. There is an inflation rider provision yeah. in the statute, in okay. the ordinance, sorry. I, okay, I, I didn't see that, but I'm not claiming to have seen everything in the ordinance. Um, I also, I wanna respond um, uh, to um, my questions last time. Um, you know, one, I'm not looking to punish uh, the non-poor, whatever that means, uh, but, <laughs> I am um, looking to support uh, folks who are marginalized. And um, again, I, I appreciate you, you sent over your opinion. I think it was shared with everyone uh, here. Um, my only concern is that this whole program would be unconstitutional if it were not for the voluntary nature of candidates choosing to participate. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Thank you. And so, if that is the case, why could, a, what changes, if a candidate is choosing to participate in this, why would that, um, why would limiting the matching funds to low income residents or marginalized residents, again, it's not race based, it's not anything that, you know, has a strict scrutiny, it is income based. I don't it does, see, it does, ahead. sorry, sorry, I didn't no, mean to go interrupt ahead. you. Go ahead, finish. It, it is subject to strict scrutiny under the Supreme Court precedent. And your question is a fair question, but you're directing it to the wrong people. You need to direct it to the U.S. Supreme Court, whose rulings I set out in that memo, and that's where the, the issue arises. No, I understand. So it, certainly because it's freedom of speech, it's First Amendment, it's, it's strict scrutiny there, but the, the, the port, and right, that's why this whole program would be unconstitutional if it were a mandate and not a voluntary program. My, my question specifically, because we are, the, the, the specific aspect about limiting the funds to um, low-income residents, certainly the fact that they're low-income residents would not trigger strict scrutiny in and of itself. That seems like that's something that would pass, um, you, know, uh, you know, regular muster. I forget exactly. I'm, it's been a while since I've been thinking about this. Uh, I can't answer from an equal protection standpoint. I haven't looked at that. Um, so I can't, uh, I won't speculate. When you get into this area, as the cases that I pointed out in the memo stress, then you are in a strict scrutiny area, and the Supreme Court has said that basically leveling the playing field, which would be the rationale for that kind of provision, is not a legitimate state, state interest, according to the Supreme Court. Mandate, and, and, and most of those cases that, I, that, that you sent over were mandates where it, it, it no, wasn't. The last case in, in the memo, the third case, Arizona case, is a voluntary system where they still held it was unconstitutional because it was tied to the amount of money that opposing candidates well, spent. Yeah, that, that, that's quite different than matching funds for you know, low-income residents and not wealthy residents. That was uh, quite literally creating a level playing field, if I'm not mistaken, where candidates essentially had to raise a similar amount or the state would match funds to get candidates to a similar amount. That, I can see the clear differentiation there where the state's saying, well, if residents are saying that they clearly prefer this person by uh, using their voice and contributions um, to, um, uh, to support that candidate, it's not the role of the state to equalize. I, I think this is very different in that we would be matching uh, low-income residents' funds um, only, which, you know, I, I don't know if I'm gonna get support here, but I, I think that is completely an option. I think we would be missing a, a good opportunity to improve this program and ensure uh, that we are encouraging uh, candidates to reach out to folks that they traditionally do not reach out to, um, that are, are traditionally low propensity voters in Evanston elections. And by moving forward with this current program, we would essentially, yes, I agree, Mayor Biss had really good points, and my time is up, I'll wrap up now. Uh, but Mayor Biss had really good points that 
you know, there are strict camp, uh, uh, contribution limits here that will be put in place and that candidates will voluntarily comply with. Um, but, um, you know, on the flip side of this, uh, this will be the city using our limited funds um, to subsidize very likely primarily the contributions of folks who can afford to make an appropriate contribution. And, and I wish we went down a route of, of, of using our limited funds to encourage folks who don't traditionally participate to participate. Thank you. Councilmember Hedekides. I was just going to answer one of his questions, but. At this time, no one is requesting to speak for the first time, so we'll go back to Councilmember Sufferton with three minutes and 45 seconds it's, left. This is a quick one, just because the word voluntary was used. It's voluntary to participate, but on the contribution side, there is no opt-out for any resident. They're not volunteering. They are participating in this because they pay taxes. Okay. Yes. All right, great. I just wanted to make sure I understood that completely. So you can volunteer to receive money, but you cannot volunteer not to contribute money. Uh, I do not know of any checkoff on the tax form for either the federal or state government that works like that. Okay. Councilman. Great. Thank you. Uh, once again, no one is asking to speak for uh, the first time, so we go back to Councilmember Hedekadis with four minutes and 58 seconds left. I was just going to say it is, you cannot opt out. It's just yeah. And I'll just clarify it. Um, the number is um, roughly a dollar per person, so yeah. Seeing no further discussion, would the clerk please take the roll? Councilmember Newsma? Aye. Councilmember Burns? Councilmember Sufferton? No. Councilmember Ravel? Aye. Councilmember Reed? No. Councilmember Hedakaris? Aye. Councilmember Kelly? Aye. Councilmember Harris? Aye. Councilmember Wynn? With six voting in favor and two voting against, the motion carries and Ordinance 56 0 23 is passed. Uh, this brings us now to call of the wards. Councilmember Newsma? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, October office hours and ward meeting uh, on Tuesday, October 3rd, 7 p.m. at Robert Crown is the ward meeting. And Saturday, October 14th, 10 to noon at Barry Pike Cafe is office hours. Thank you. Councilmember Burns. Councilmember Stafferton. Councilmember Ravel. No report. Councilmember Reed. Uh, ward meeting this Thursday, 6 p.m. at Robert Crown. We'll have Assessor Fritz Kagey. Um, to uh, come and discuss property taxes and uh, the work that his office has been doing. We'll also have representatives from pallet shelters um, uh, to discuss uh, their uh, shelter solutions uh, that could be used for um, undocumented fo or for, for asylum seekers and for ho uh, folks who are unhoused in our community. Um, and then we'll have officers Galindo and Brooks uh, there to discuss uh, crime statistics and trends within the 8th Ward. Uh, and we invite uh, folks from all over the city to attend the session with Assessor Kagey. Um, just one, uh, we had a, a, a protest here today of sorts. And I, I just want to encourage Evanstonians to And I encourage folks to be strategic in how you make your voices heard in a way that will have impact. Um, and so I encourage folks to be more thoughtful about the way that they protest and try to urge this body to do what, uh, what folks believe is right. Um, maybe it's not the place of an elected official to tell folks how to protest, but uh, I do think there are certainly more of effective ways um, than what happened today, which would really was just more disruptive uh, than anything else. Thank you. Council Member Hedekadis. Ninth Ward office hours, Friday the 29th. Um, I will be at Reprise Roasters from 9 till 11 um, a.m. and I will be joined by Sergeant Brown from EPD. Council Member Kelly. 
We'll have our first ward in-person public safety meeting on Tuesday, October 3rd with Officer Brian Rust. We're meeting at on the patio of the graduate if weather, um, the weather's okay. So next Tuesday at four o'clock. Thank you. Councilmember Harris. Thank you. The makeup, the makeup meeting for that I missed when I was ill will be Thursday at 7.30 via Zoom. That's it. Councilmember Wynn. Yes, third ward office hours on Thursday, October 5th from 7.30 to 9.30 at Brothers K. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, Councilmember Newsom is recognized to make a motion. Pursuant to five Illinois compiled statutes, 120 slash 2C, uh, I move that the city council convene into executive session to discuss agenda items regarding personnel and minutes review. These agenda items are permitted subjects to be considered in executive ses session and are enumerated exceptions under the Open Meetings Act. These exceptions are 5 ILCS 120 slash 2C1 and 21. Second. Councilmember Newsom moves to the City Council move into executive discussion to discuss the items just mentioned. Councilmember Harris seconds. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please take the roll? Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Councilmember Burns? Councilmember Sufferden? Aye. Councilmember Ravel? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Hedakaris? Aye. Councilmember Kelly? Aye. Councilmember Harris? Aye. Councilmember Wynn? With eight voting in favor and none voting against, the motion carries. And at 7.43 p.m., the City Council moves into executive session to begin immediately in the Council Member Library.